Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the book of Ephesians, We're beginning chapter 2 this morning. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 in that Christmas carol hymn that we just sang. There's that last statement, Christ was born to save, Christ was born to save. That's really Christmas, and uh, that's the reason we have this passage that we're going to look at this morning. Here's the reason why Christ needed to come and save. Now, I've taken seven verses, and that doesn't seem like a great deal, but there's a great deal of information and doctrine in these verses. I could have probably cut it down to two or three lessons very easily. But what I want to show, and the reason I take this as a whole, is I want you to see the before and after. The before is pretty grim, but the after is glorious. So we need to read this all in context and all together. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What is it? Angels fear to tread where whatever. This is one of those texts, I think, that most <laughs> preachers don't want to tread into. Uh, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That word spirit in that uh, last part of the verse, the spirit that is now working, is not a, um, an evil spirit. It's not a demon. It's the spirit of the age. And I think we, we need to understand this, and I'll mention this again. But the prince of the power of the air, the prince of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. We've been saved to be a great picture and example of His grace and mercy. We've been saved for His glory. We will forever enjoy that great blessing and forever reflect it to His glory, which is the chief end of man, the purpose of everything. Well, let's bow in a word of prayer and thank the Lord for this time together and our time of study together. Let's pray. Father, we... Humorist James Thurber wrote an article for the New Yorker in 1960 titled, The Trouble with Man is Man. Paul would have said amen to that. The reason is given in the first verses of Ephesians chapter 2 where the apostle wrote, and you, and by application that means you and me and all of us, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. That's bad news. The good news is, that's not a problem God cannot fix. In fact, He has fixed it because Paul then wrote in verse 4 and verse 5, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. That's the best news. It's all about grace. It's about sovereign grace. But we can't understand grace unless we see it against the dark background of sin and death and helplessness. And I underscore that last word, helplessness. Utter helplessness. That's what Paul states here in chapter 2. In order to give the Ephesian saints and to give us clarity on God's goodness and grace 
to demonstrate that our salvation was altogether of the Lord. In chapter 1, Paul revealed God's eternal plan of salvation in choosing a people for himself. And in verses 18 and 19, he expressed the desire that the Ephesians would understand that. He prayed that they would know the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, that we would know the greatness of God's saving grace. So here... In the first verses of chapter 2, Paul shows the greatness of God's power to save by stating the greatness of the trouble from which He saved us, rescued us from utter helplessness. That's our condition, and it's important that we know that. But there's the rub, so to speak. Even believers have trouble with this very thing. Man does not want to consider how bleak his condition is, his lostness, his inability, his guilt. It's always been the problem. The ancient Greeks said, know thyself. Wise advice. But Calvin commented in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, the philosophers taught men to consider only what would boost their self-confidence. With the result, people are persuaded that there's nothing really wrong with them, that uh, there's no, nothing in them worthy of blame. They are okay. And in fact, man is competent in himself to lead a good and happy life. Consequently, knowing thyself in the wrong way is not good. People trust in their own ability, and as Calvin wrote, we stubbornly insist on going our own way until we come to utter ruin. In fact, only our Creator is capable of making ourselves known to us. He did that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. There is nothing here to persuade us that we are well, that we are competent in and of ourselves for anything good. Here, Paul states the problem in the darkest, starkest terms. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's the description of the human condition universally in a fallen world. We can only understand this from a knowledge of the catastrophe that occurred at the beginning of human history when Adam failed to obey God, fell, and brought all of us down with him. He died and we died. Just as God warned him he would if he ate the forbidden fruit, in the day you eat from it you will surely die. Genesis 2 verse 17. And Paul says here, what he says here is based on that. Without an understanding of that, man can see imperfection in humanity, but also nobility, and conclude wrongly. Humans are flawed, but improving, and will rise from the dust to glory. That's our hope. But Paul destroys that notion with one word. Dead. It's an absolute statement. Not sick unto death, not half dead, but capable of improving. No. Dead. Lifeless. Now obviously people have physical life. They move about. They enjoy good health. They engage in business and romance and intellectual pursuits. But they're dead spiritually. This word dead was used of the prodigal son by his father. This son of mine was dead, he said, and has come to life again. He was cut off from all communion and life with the family. And that's the condition of the natural man. The soul is alienated, cut off from God and his life spiritually without any communication, without any understanding, without any desire for understanding. 
That's Paul's meaning. People are unresponsive to God and the things of God that is without positive response. They do react negatively. Paul stated that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. A natural man, that is a man who's not been reborn, has not been regenerate, the natural unbelieving man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Cannot. He's dead. And Paul gives the reason for that. It's sin. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And we can no more cure ourselves than a dead man can raise himself. We're hopelessly helpless. Again, all of that is due to Adam's failure. Paul wrote in Romans 5 verse 12, through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. When the original man sin, sinned, he fell, and as a result, all his descendants fell with him. We inherited the consequences, his guilt and sin nature, then physical death due to that spiritual death. Modern man dismisses that as a myth, not history, not revelation, but the consequence is man cannot understand his, her condition and need, cannot understand themselves as a result of dismissing those first three chapters of the Bible. I think I've made this point more than once, I make it again. The, the first three chapters of the book of, uh, of the Bible are essential for understanding reality. That's, that's why they've been given. And that's why they have been attacked so fiercely over the past, what, 150, 200 years. They reveal that God is, that He is the Creator, and that we are His creatures. We are not our own. But men don't like that. Men never have. That, that's why Adam rebelled and fell. But if we don't understand that, we won't understand why the world is in the condition that it is in. Mankind will never understand history, never understand nature, why it is red in tooth and claw, never understand themselves and their need and will, as Calvin said, go on stubbornly until they come to utter ruin. But Paul here is not talking to mankind. He's not trying to convert mankind. He is not trying to, to convince the world of anything. He's writing to the church to the saints to explain to them the greatness of grace and the greatness of God's love. That is what produces gratitude, which galvanizes obedience from a willing heart. So Paul amplifies their former condition. He explains it further in verses 2 and 3, what life was like before grace intervened with a description of the pattern of their behavior, what he calls their walk. Because of Adam's fall and their sins, that is the Ephesians' sins and ours, because of our sin, we were held captive under three malign influences, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We were directed by them. In the past, we fell short of the instruction of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. That's how we did walk. That's how all of us walked. We followed the course of this world. Literally, that is the age of this world. It has the idea of what is fashionable in this age. Every age has its fashion, which is always changing. What is constant about it, it is, is, it is always against God. In each age, 
Its thinking, its ideas are inspired by the world, which is society organized to enhance man's glory, not God's. It's what directed the men of Genesis chapter 11 who built the Tower of Babel. Come, they said, let's build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Let's do something that will make ourselves great. It's the opposite of what God told them to do. Previously, we all walked like that, living for the moment, living for self and to promote self. But there's also a spiritual influence in this secular, materialistic system, and it's satanic. Because Paul adds, we walked under the influence and according to the prince of the power of the air. Old Nick was our captain. The New American Standard Bible translates it prince, but the, the Greek word archon means ruler, commander, chief, lord, all of these ideas. Christ called him the ruler of this world in, in John chapter 12, verse 31. Later in Ephesians, Paul identifies him as the devil. He has great power or authority and influence. Paul puts his domain in the air, in the atmosphere above us where his, his minions and lieutenants, his demons are. Paul speaks of them later in chapter 6 as the spiritual forces of wickedness. But he also is active on earth and he's active in our lives in various ways. A, a, a fact that was accepted universally in times past, but today it's out of fashion in our materialistic age. Nevertheless, the Bible is clear about his existence and his activity. Job describes Satan going to and fro on the earth. John calls him the evil one in whose power the whole world lies. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. The whole world lies in the evil one. He is in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden and throughout the book of Revelation where he is called the great dragon, the serpent of old, who deceives the whole world. Paul gives a lot of attention to that subject later in chapter 6 where he explains the spiritual warfare, all that's going on behind the scenes, the invisible war. So the unregenerate, the unbelieving follows the course, the values or ways of this world, but they are also under the influence and the direction of the ruler of this world, the evil one, Satan. Paul describes how it happens next in this in his statement, the spirit that is now working among the sons of disobedience, or, or literally, as I as indicated in our reading of the text, now that's of the spirit. So the, the spirit is the spirit of the age that Satan governs. He is the prince of the power of the air and the prince of the spirit of this age which is now working in the sons of disobedience. Meaning he governs the thinking of this age. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul wrote that he has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. And one way he has done that is to blind the minds of the unbelieving to his existence. He works best in secret. He works best in the dark. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 that he disguises himself as an angel of light, as one who brings truth, as, as one who brings enlightenment while he actually blinds people to the truth. His agents do the same thing. Paul goes on to speak of them as disguising themselves as servants of righteousness. They are in pulpits. They are in university classrooms fabricating the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, it is 
godless, but it's convincing. Satan is the master of counterfeit and deception. And he's always at work in the thinking and beliefs of men through false ideas of reality or false ideas of giving happiness. He holds people in his power through what seems to be noble or scientific or romantic ideas that are, are really just cleverly desi designed, devised deceptions. He builds the broad way that is very appealing, the wide way that's very accepting. So it's captivating. It's more than that, it's convincing and enslaving. And Paul reminds the Ephesians in verse 3 that they were once a part of that. We all were, he said. Among them we too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. It's all of us in our pre-Christian days. We were no different from the rest. That is, from the rest of the unbelieving world. We were in bondage to the flesh, which is the third malign influence. The world and the devil influence us from outside. This is the influence from the inside. Our desires, our lusts. Here's where the, the trouble of man is man. We are ruled by our desires. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, Paul named the deeds of the flesh a list of 15 vices from immorality to idolatry to jealousy and drunkenness. I, I'm sure all 15 fall within this description of the lusts of the flesh. But the word lusts gives a, a clear indication of the nature of the condition. The majority of cases in which that word is used, it means the strong desire for something evil. So in times past, we all lived among the sons of disobedience under the control of our lusts, our desires, yielding to all kinds of temptations and indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Well, what are the lusts of the mind? Any number of things, I think, from, from intellectual ambition and pride to avarice to greed, the desire for wealth, and all that, that, that drives the natural man without exception. I don't think it's wrong to have ambition, to have a desire to improve. We should. We should be striving for that. Have a desire to have a position in a company or in an academic institution. But what's the motive behind it? If it's selfish ambition, that's a problem. And that's so much of what is described in, uh, in, in this lusts of the mind. All that drives the natural man without exception. And it falls under the biblical doctrine of total depravity. An off-putting term, I know. The idea of depravity conjures up images of, of degenerate moral monsters. And people know they're not that. I'm, I'm not... A Nazi, I'm not Hamas. So it's offensive. But the term does not mean that we are totally bad. It doesn't mean that we are, we, that all human beings are equally bad and that nobody is capable of doing anything good at all. That we are on the very bottom rung. People are capable of great kindness and generosity to the poor and, and those in need. Uh, unbelievers have displayed great bravery and self-sacrifice on the battlefield. The doctrine doesn't deny that. Total depravity simply means that we are all fallen and that no part of a person from the body to the mind to the will 
or affections. No part of us has been left untainted by sin. It's touched every aspect of us. Sin has affected every part of our being. It has caused death. And spiritual death has caused corruption. All people are equally dead, but not equally corrupt. We're not all alike in our behavior. So let me illustrate what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. The Battle of the Somme was one of the deadliest battles in history. On the morning of July 1st, 1916, British troops left the, left the trenches and went over the top and marched toward the German lines. They thought the Germans had been obliterated. They had just waited a month as the British bombed their position. A solid month, month, day and night, people could hear the cannons in, in London from what they were pounding them from that whole month. And so they walked out onto that battlefield thinking, oh, they were going to find a, an obliterated German army. The fact is, they had not touched them. And as they got near, the German machine guns opened fire, and within the first minute of battle, thousands were cut down. On the first day, there were over 57,000 casualties, and almost 20,000 were killed. Well, days passed before the rescuers could go out into no man's land and search for survivors. And when they did, they came across bodies in various conditions, various stages of decay. Those who died immediately were in the advanced stages and obviously dead, but others that had died only recently, waiting for their rescuers to come, perhaps died only minutes before, appeared in a more hopeful condition. They might have even seemed to be sleeping. But one was really no better than the other. No less dead than the other, regardless of how the appearance would have seemed. And so it is with all the spiritually dead. Some show less corruption. They do humanly good things. But they're all equally dead. And that means everyone by nature is so profoundly separated from God that's that were, that were described in that way. Many may compare favorably with other people. They're honest in business, kind to others, are good citizens, they're patriots. They have good values in comparison to others who are pure hedonists. The distance between the two may be wide, but the distance between both of them and God is infinite and unbridgeable. They are dead, unable to bridge the gap, and unwilling to bridge the gap, dead. Now that's a stinging indictment on the human race. All are spiritually corrupt, guilty of sin, and utterly incapable of changing their condition or being reconciled to God. Helpless. But again... Paul's purpose here is not to accuse the human race. It's to show the saints the greatness of grace in God's power toward us who believe. And, and what He has gained for us. Paul shows that next in verses 4 through 7 and introduces it with two of the greatest words in the Bible. But God... We were dead, sons of disobedience, willfully going our own way and guilty, children of wrath, doomed. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. This little word, but, has been called a mighty adversative. It moves us from death to life and gives the answer to the human condition. The remedy for the human condition, which is God and His mercy. One of the greatest statements in the Bible is Micah chapter 7, verse 18. God delights in mercy. 
That's why we receive it. Only because he delights in it. That's what Paul develops here. But God being rich in mercy, giving help to the helpless, that's what mercy is. It's been defined in different ways, but that's what God did for us. His motive for doing this is his love, his great love. He is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now that's humbling. It should be humbling. The reason for God's mercy is not traced to something in us, not some redeeming virtue in us or some great thing we've done. We were dead in our sins, and when He looks upon us in our natural condition, that's what He sees. People dead in their sins. The reason for His mercy is found only in Him and His infinite, inscrutable love. To that, Paul added in verses 5 and 7, grace and kindness. Leon Morris made a keen observation. He he wrote, We are mistaken if we think of him as a rather stern judge, so that we must be on our guard at all times, lest we offend him. He is a judge, of course, but the New Testament writers came to see that the qualities that mark out our God are qualities like mercy and love and grace and kindness. It's important to recognize this as we seek to serve our God. I think Morris is right about that. The Lord is always for us. We should draw, that, that should cause us to draw close to Him. He's a loving, gracious, merciful God. Verse 5 gives the reason to do that, to draw close to Him, where Paul repeats verse 1, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Even then, God showed mercy toward us and made us alive together with Christ. And Paul adds, it's all of grace. By grace you have been saved. Now what a picture of grace this gives. Grace and mercy. When we were dead in sin, He still loved us and changed us. We were dead when He gave us life. In, in the imagery of, of Ezekiel, He did spiritual heart surgery on us. He, he took out the heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh, a living heart. A heart that's able to respond and able to do and, and please Him. That's Ezekiel 36, verse 26. When we were separated from God and hostile toward God without understanding, without ability to understand or desire to understand or love Him, He loved us and He gave us life. Gave us life now, presently. It's what John called eternal life. We have a glorious future and have nothing to fear after death. But as Leon Morris put it, we have nothing to fear before death either. We have life now. Every child of God, everyone born of God, everyone born again has life, eternal life now. Paul wrote, he gave us life together with Christ. Our new life is lived with the Savior. He is with us and His life is in us. He guides us. He enlightens us through the Holy Spirit. He enables us daily, moment by moment. That's what Christ won for us through His death and resurrection. But not only that, but also raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are there now in our representative. Just as we were on the cross with Christ uh, as our substitute, as our representative, we are now seated in heaven with Him at the Father's right hand. It's as though we, we, we really live there. 
And so, while we are here on this earth, where Satan is the prince, the ruler, nevertheless, we have all of heaven on our side and working for us. We're citizens of that heavenly realm. Our souls are as secure here on earth as Christ is secure now in heaven at the Father's right hand. If Christ can be pulled down from His throne in heaven, then we can lose our eternal place with Him. In other words, we are forever safe and secure. So we can sing with confidence, Through many dangerous toils and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. That's the the assurance John Newton had, and it's the assurance Paul gives us in verse 7, where he says, In the ages to come, God will show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we will be there for ages to come. Bright shining as the sun, as Newton also said. For all eternity, we will display the glory of God's grace through our resurrected, glorified bodies and character. And we will enjoy that glory. What an undeserved blessing. Since the trouble with man is man, and that trouble being we were dead, stone cold dead spiritually, unable to fix the trouble, unable to remedy the problem, God fixed it by His great grace. We are rich beyond measure. Our future is certain and secure. How then, in light of this great grace, should we live in this present day? Well, obviously, we should live with gratitude. And we should live to the Lord's glory. Thomas Erskine, as I have repeated in the past, was right in the New Testament, religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. What we do in the purest sense, the purest way, the best kind of obedience is obedience from a grateful heart. It's obedience that is lived in the power of God, but with gratitude for what He's done for us. And He's done these great things in our life in the most subtle of ways, almost imperceptibly, how He changes a heart and brings one who is in rebellion to peace with the Lord and faith with Him. Presbyterian minister... Charles uh, Clarence McCartney gave a, an illustration from James Gardner, a colonel in the British Army. He was a brave, daring soldier, but a hedonist, a, a rake who boasted in it. Frequently, he narrowly escaped death, but that had no effect upon him. He never considered abandoning his sins and adulteries. He, he, was, he was dead. In fact, he defied God to change him. Then on a Sunday evening in 1719, while waiting to meet a woman, he happened to pick up a book that his mother gave him when he left home to take up a soldier's life. The book was titled, The Christian Soldier, or Heaven Taken by Storm. He picked it up just in a moment of boredom, I guess, waiting for his companion, and he began to read it. And he saw Christ on the cross with glory and heard a voice in his mind saying, Oh, sinner, did I suffer all this for thee, and these are the returns? And he was convicted and converted. He was made alive from the dead and became a a true Christian soldier. And when he later, years later, died on the battlefield, he gave a great confession of his hope. He knew where he was going because of what Christ had done. Now that's the surpassing greatness of his power. 
It works through a book or the spoken word to soften a heart, to bring life into that dead heart unexpectedly and bring a person to understanding, faith, and eternal joy. If you've never experienced the power of God's grace, you can't earn it. Grace is a gift. The free gift of God. And it is found only in Jesus Christ, God's Son and our Savior. If you want life, if you want real joy, come to Christ. If you want forgiveness, look to Him who died in the place of sinners so that all who trust in Him would be changed from death to life and changed in order to give glory to God in the way we live and what we experience. May God help you to do that. Well, let's stand and sing words of praise to our Lord. Number 44 in the Songs of Praise book, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Number 44. Father, that is so true. Left to ourselves, we would mock the cross with those that did. But because of your infinite, unconditional, eternal love for your people, you sent your Son to ransom us, redeem us, buy us out of the slavery and the slave house of sin and judgment by paying our ransom. And his wounds paid that. His death was a sacrificial death for us, which we could not have made, only He could do it. We thank You that You sent Him into the world and thank our Savior for coming, for the joy set before Him to save His people. Thank You for Your grace. This season of the year, we pray that You would help us to focus on that and rejoice in what You've done through Your Son. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.